So these are some options that you might have for how you might want to die. I guess the question is rather morbid, isn't it? Um, but it's a question that I think I'd like to concentrate on for a little while. The fact is none of these things is much fun to work on. Now, um, this is what my foundation does, the Sense Foundation. Um, we're a US registered charity, and this is our one-sentence mission statement. Um, now, you might think at first that, well, hang on, aging is a good way to die. You know, natural causes. Um, dying of old age sounds like dying having escaped all of the horrible things I had on the previous slide and all the innumerable ones that I didn't bother to list. Um, but there's a bit of a problem there, which is this. Um, death from aging is not simply death from natural causes. Anything that mainly kills the elderly, anything that young adults essentially never die of, is death from aging one way or another which means that if we look at the international classification of diseases, we can determine very clearly that something in the region of two-thirds of all deaths worldwide are from aging, which means 100... I mean, that's 30 World Trade Centers every day. OK. And in the developed world, of course, it's a great deal more than two-thirds, it's something like 90%. All right, so, I mean, and let's face it, now, I mean, even if you don't get the diseases of old age, um, it's, you know, um, even if you're as lucky as Martha's mother, you're still you're still not having as much fun as you were when you were younger. Um, I mean, I don't, I, I'm very much in favour of, of uh, being positive about all the wonderful things that elderly people accumulate in their lives, all the wisdom and, and experience and so on. But the fact is that we should not be downplaying or ignoring the fact that it would be that much better if those same people with all those experiences and all that wisdom also had the vigour, the physical and mental agility that they had as young adults. So, you know... <laughs> Let's, let's just look at that question a little bit. The fact is, it's not fun, and also, hello, it's very expensive indeed to be, to be elderly. This is just you know, a random statistic, uh, the latest number I could come up with, for how much it costs just in the USA alone for keeping the elderly going in the frail and decrepit state that a large proportion of them are in for that extra year or two. So, I mean, put it this way, is, is this humanity's worst problem? You know, we've got a lot of problems, but... I think this, there's a good case that this really is the worst one of all. 100,000 people a day is a lot of people and a lot of suffering. What else matches that? Well, OK, so um, here's another point. Here's a good answer, perhaps, a popular answer to the question of how do you want to die? Painlessly, you know, without a lot of um, suffering from disease and decrepitude. But, of course, involuntarily. And that's a little bit of a problem because the fact is that, um, you know, the longer we keep people healthy and um, in the absence of decrepitude and disease, the longer they're going to live. We're going to be able to postpone the period of ill health if we manage to do that, but we're not going to significantly compress it. Now, the good news, of course, is the reason why this is double-edged is we're not likely to extend it either. A lot of people, when they think about the concept of combating aging, they think about the idea of keeping people alive in that frail and undesirable state of health that they're in late in life today. But that's not what we're all about. We're about extending the healthy part of life. However, as I say, we probably aren't going to be able, dramatically at least, to compress the period of morbidity at the end of life. There are some um, possibilities out there that may allow us to do this, but only a little bit, not a dramatic amount. So then, you know, what's left? Well, I'm going to come back to this question about how do you want to die, and I'm going to ask a related question. When do you want to die? Here are some answers that you might get from people if you ask them that question, but they're stupid answers, because ultimately these are answers based on how, what chronological age you want to die at. And as Martha pointed out a moment ago, chronological age is a very poor measure of the value of life, whether to oneself or to one's loved ones. And um, therefore the correct right answer to this question is, you know, not yet. <laughs> really. <laughs> and, um, I, I, you know, and, and that's actually true for most people, even if they are in a relatively um, you know, diminished state. Here's another question. Why do you want to die? Because most people do, you see. If you ask them, if you, if you say, well, OK, how about we actually fix this completely and, and, and everyone's able to live right up until they cross the road carelessly, uh, then, you know, people will say, oh, dear, that'd be terrible. I get so bored. And it's like, I get so bored not getting Alzheimer's and being able to remember everything. Uh, you know, um, and, 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 you know, I mean, the other answers I have here are no, are no better, really. If you think about these things realistically and, you know, about the 
sense of proportion that one should have about the fact that we actually have a problem today, hello, we have these 100,000 people that are suffering these things, then the sorts of changes in society that might be in danger of happening as a result of seriously combating aging you know, tend to lose their um, you know, decisiveness, so to speak. Um, so, OK, I mean, hang on, though, people will say. Maybe you're right, maybe you're right, but who cares? Because we can't do anything about aging. You know, aging is inevitable, you know, so let's just get used to it. And the fact is, I have some sympathy with that attitude. Because the fact is, it is rational to put out of your mind ghastly things in your future that you can't do anything about. And it doesn't matter how irrational your rationalizations are. It doesn't matter what you th what, how you convince yourself that, for example, aging is actually a good thing, because you can't avoid it. The thing is, though, we may be coming to a point where it's not so simple as that. Who says that we can't change it? Who actually says that we can't change it? I know that most of the people in the audience here are either scientists or are at least scientifically sophisticated people. And some of you may be thinking, well, why is Aubrey up here belaboring all this stuff about desirability and the crazy excuses that people give to defend aging? Well, there's a reason. It's actually scientists are not immune to what I'm showing you on this slide. Scientists are not immune, in my experience, to the tendency to hold the following two beliefs simultaneously. Belief number one, I refuse to bother thinking seriously about whether aging can actually be combated by foreseeable medicine, because, let's face it, it wouldn't be a good idea anyway. We would have overpopulation and dictators living forever and all those other things. Um, but they hold at the same time the view that they're not going to think seriously about whether, in fact, it is desirable to defeat aging or to combat aging, um, and whether all these su the supposed problems are actually real, because, let's face it, it's not possible. You know, so have this glorious, horrible circularity of, of denying each of these things on the basis of not thinking about the other. And so I'm going to try and convince you in the next few minutes that actually we might be able to get somewhere with all of this. I'm going to use this definition of aging, which I quite like. All I'm saying basically here is that metabolism, the, um, you know, the, the, the whole panoply of chemical and cellular processes that are going on in our bodies all the time to keep us alive from one day to the next, causes pathology, which is the word I'm going to use to embrace everything that goes wrong later in life. And that, that, that happens in a manner that is age-related because it happens as a result of accumulating intermediates. And I'm going to use the word damage to denote those intermediates. Things that are caused by the metabolic processes that we need, that keep us going, but that are not adequately um, cleaned up, so to speak, so that they accumulate throughout life and eventually get to a level of abundance that is problematic for metabolism so that pathologies start to emerge. Now, that's a really useful definition of aging because this is what it actually um, leads to in terms of potential for intervention. So we've heard just now from Martha about geriatrics, and it's undoubted that if we can address the emerging pathologies of aging before they've got too far, and do what we can in terms of helping people with a better, to have a better lifestyle and giving them the best medicines and so on, to slow down the progression of pathology, then we can give people a better quality of life for a larger amount of time, no question, and that's a really good thing. But as everyone who works in the geriatrics profession is abundantly aware, there's only so much we can do that way. Ultimately, people go downhill anyway, and the amount that we can actually shift people into delaying the pathologies of aging is really you know, considerably less than the natural variation that exists among the population between people who just are intrinsically healthy ages and people who are not. So, you know, it's, it's better than nothing, but it's not all that much better. And realistically, it's never going to be much better than nothing. So then, a lot of people who work on the biology of aging, who are interested in the mechanistic processes that actually lead to the pathologies of old age, say, well, OK, maybe prevention is better than cure. So these are people who call themselves biogerontologists, and they say, well, let's try and clean up metabolism. Let's try and make, meta make our metabolic processes lay down these various types of damage more slowly than they naturally would. And that's a pretty neat idea, and we'll hear a bit about the most promising approach to doing that from David Sinclair in a few minutes. Um, but the fact is, again, it doesn't look very hopeful that we'll be able to get a dramatic postponement of the um, ill health of old age that way. So what we'd really like is something better than all of that. And I think there is something better. I'm going to call it the maintenance approach. And it's an approach that says, let's leave those two processes alone. 
Let's actually let metabolism lay down damage, and let's let damage cause pathology, but let's postpone the second of those processes by repairing damage, by keeping the overall abundance of damage down through periodic repair to a level that doesn't allow these pathologies to emerge. And I think that's a much more promising process. Um, I'm going to show you an analogy for a little while. Here's a car, and um, I'd like you to raise your hand. Anyone who's got a, who owns, whose main car that they actually use day to day is more than 30 years old. Anyone? More than 30 years old? All right, not very many, right? Most cars don't last that long. Right. This car is more than 50 years old, and it is the main car that its owner uses. How come? And it's not the only one by any means. How come? Simple answer, it's got style. Its owners didn't want to junk it and go and get a new one because they love it. And so they've done a lot of maintenance on it, an exceptional amount of maintenance, and they carry on doing that periodically, and it really works. This car is 50 years old, and it's not going away anytime soon. Here's an in indication of exactly what I mean. There are cars twice that age, which are obviously not used every day, but are still working just as well as they were when they were built more than 100 years ago. So maintenance really works if you do it comprehensively enough. And um, you may think, well, hang on, <laughs> what am I actually saying here? Am I trying to say that the human body is just a machine? And the fact is, yes, that is exactly what I'm saying. The human body is just a machine. If we think about it, yes, the human body is exceptionally complicated, and we don't have the plans, we don't have a blueprint, so we don't really know very much about how the human body works. Plus, also, they have this weird thing that man-made machines have in extremely small quantities, if at all, namely, lots of inbuilt, automatic self-repair. You know, repair processes that actually fix things as they happen. But none of that changes the fact that the human body is still a machine. So it should be possible to actually adopt this maintenance approach on the human body. And that's what I'm going to tell you about for a few minutes. First of all, the question is, what is this thing called damage that I've talked about so far just in the abstract? And I'm going to claim to you today that actually we can classify all of the various molecular and cellular changes in the body that qualify as damage, in other words, that are caused by metabolism and that eventually contribute to age-related pathology. We can classify them all into these seven major, major um, classes, and um, you know, these are obviously very straightforward, concrete things. Loss of cells, meaning you know, cells dying and not being automatically replaced by the division of other cells. Junk, you know, accumulating molecular byproducts of metabolic processes that are not broken down and are also not excreted. Why do I think this is a comprehensive list? Well, I could give you a complicated biological reason, but I'll just give you the simple circumstantial argument, which is that it's been the same list for more than a quarter of a century. That's pretty good news. Here's the really good news, though. I think we have a good chance of actually addressing all of these things by what I'm calling the maintenance approach, by repairing, or in some cases just making harmless, um, the various types of damage that I just listed. So I've got here a nice list of the sorts of things that we're going to be able to do. Stem cell therapy to combat cell loss, for example. Um, in some cases, simply vaccinations to make, to make a problem go away. It's, it's all you know, stuff that we, we should be able to do. Now, some of you, especially the biologists out there, may be thinking, well, this is all very airy-fairy science fiction, isn't it? But the thing is, it's not. We've heard about regenerative medicine a good deal over the past 24 hours, and we'll be hearing more later on, and this is simply regenerative medicine. The only thing that really distinguishes what I'm saying here from what people have been saying in the talks that we heard last night, for example, from Tony Atala, from Daniel Kraft, and so on, is that we'll be doing regenerative medicine of a, against a lot of different conditions, or, to put it more precisely, against the precursors of those conditions, at the same time in the same people, because aging is, as I've already shown you, very multifaceted. So the evidence that this could work is simply the evidence that regenerative medicine is moving forward on all of these fronts. And we've just got to end up putting it all together. Yes, it's a leap of faith to say that we will be able to put it all together and when we do it will be comprehensive enough to really work. But the fact is, that's what any complex new technology, new pioneering technological project is like. You try and understand how the solution might work, you break the problem down into parts, you identify how to solve the parts, you implement those um, solutions, you put the whole thing together. And until you've put it together, you don't know whether the original design, so to speak, was actually going to work, but technology does actually work. So this is a perfectly realistic approach. And now, um, of course, you'd like to know that I have actually some detail behind this. Of course, I published a book a couple of 
Uh, years ago, I had an entire chapter on each of these various technologies that I listed on the previous slide, so I obviously don't have time to talk about that right now. Um, however, I, we do have a little booklet that's actually available that was published by some colleagues of ours in Russia. Um, that is in English, <laughs> I assure you, um, and we have, we have only 150 copies, I think, around, but we'll be, uh, we'll be giving them out later on, and it summarizes in perhaps 25 pages the sorts of things that I'm talking about. Um, however, um, I still want to come back to the doubts and the concerns and the resistance that some of you may still be feeling about this whole thing. And one thing that comes up a lot is thinking, well, you know, hang on, yes, this is okay, but let's face it, you know, we have succeeded in the past, let's say, 50 years in postponing the ill health of old age, you know, at least a decade or 15 years relative to how people were. And that has actually, you know, given a lot of health and a lot of wealth, for that matter, to society. So, you know, the problem is, though, we still have ageing. In fact, ageing is in some sense more prevalent. We have more people reaching an age where age-related pathologies are really serious. Um, but the fact is that delay works quite well if you can just keep it up. Um, some people have... Hello, what's going on here? There we go. Um, so here's that car again. Uh, you know, this is a car that is more than 100 years old, as I mentioned. We don't have cars that are 200 years old, but that's not because we don't know how. It's because we hadn't invented cars 200 years ago. So if you actually um, you know, have heard about me in the media, then you will probably have read or seen articles or programs with titles like this. And I have to say that I'm a little bit pissed off at the way that I get treated in the media this way, and I tend to say so more than I used to. Because the fact is that um, you know, my work does tend to be characterised in terms that, shall we say, allow the audience to maintain emotional distance from the problem um, by describing it in a manner that, must, uh, um, that focuses on the longevity aspect of this. Thing. Now, of course, I'm not saying that that's misrepresentation, because it's true that I do think that we will be able to postpone ageing indefinitely in all of this way. I've, in, I've introduced a concept that I like to call longevity escape velocity, which basically says that once we've got the first maybe 30 years of uh, um, extension of life applied by regenerative medicine approaches, then we will be able to stay one step ahead of the problem indefinitely, because we'll be improving the technology fast enough for that to be the case. Um, but nevertheless, you know, I do not think that they, it's appropriate for that to be the focus, because the fact is we're talking about keeping people healthy. The longevity benefits that we're talking about are a side benefit. They are not the main theme of what all of this is about. They are a benefit, certainly, but they are not the purpose. The purpose is to stop people from getting sick. If you don't want Alzheimer's, if you don't want cancer, if you don't want cardiovascular disease as long as you live, however long that may be, then this is the way that we're going to give you what you want. Uh, this is the foundation, again, that I work for, Sense Foundation, and uh, whether you have money or time, we can certainly do with you. And I have eight seconds left, so I'll stop there. Thank you.